Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight's topic is Navicular Syndrome, Early Interventions, and Long-Term Management, brought to you by Decra Veterinary Products, makers of OSFOS. The navicular is a small bone in the horse's foot that can cause really big problems. The bad news, it's progressive uh, and degenerative and doesn't have a cure. Fortunately, today we have a better understanding of what goes wrong with the navicular bone and its surrounding structures, and we have more tools to keep our horses comfortable, including therapeutic shoeing, pharmaceuticals, and management strategies. To help us better understand navicular, we're joined tonight by Dr. Duncan Peters of East West Equine Sports Medicine and Dr. Tori Maxwell with Decra Veterinary Products. Let's go ahead and start with you, Dr. Peters. Uh, can you tell us about your experience helping horses with navicular? Well, thank you, Michelle. And um, I've been in the equine practice for greater than 30 years and worked on uh, pleasure horses all the way up to Olympic horses. Unfortunately, all these horses in all these categories have some problems with lameness relating to the navicular region and, or the heel region of the of the foot and in, in all breeds we see it and in all disciplines uh, it can be very frustrating condition for owners and i'm sure we'll probably uh, hear that vein tonight and some of the questions that from the participants tonight uh, but generally treatment and the success of treatment usually depends on a multifactorial approach and a team effort of people involved with the horse. And we, as you mentioned, we have a number of things that are helping us uh, to better decipher and uh, figure out what's going on with this uh, disease process. And Dr. Maxwell, can you tell us about your experience and background working with navicular horses? Yes, and thank you, Michelle, also for uh, including me in tonight's uh, webinar on education. I'm really excited hearing the number of people that are wanting to pursue further education on this topic. I also was very privileged to be up to grow up around horses. I've been riding since I was four years old and showing at that age as well. So I've been in the business for over actually five decades now. I'm forever indebted to the horse. He has made my life really interesting and amazing me and brought me to unique places. My career over the years from performance horses and my interest in lameness has brought me to industry and being associated with drugs and uh, pharmaceutical development of um, products to enhance horses lameness and address this sort of ongoing disease processes that are out there. So I think tonight's group is going to find a lot of really inf interesting information this evening. Thank okay. you. Yeah, and we have a ton of questions and are expecting a huge audience to join us tonight. Um, I want to give everyone a quick review of our Ask the Live format. We're going to be starting with those questions that you submitted during registration. If you have questions you'd like to ask live or you would like a clarification on something that the doctors have mentioned um, or, uh, or you have a follow-up question, go ahead and enter it in the chat window in front of you. Uh, we're going to do our best to get to as many questions as possible uh, this evening. So let's go ahead and jump right in. And I think the uh, the first question is for you, Dr. Maxwell, and it came from Scott in Winslow, Maine. And this this is a big one because it's it's very confusing. What is the difference between the terms navicular disease and navicular syndrome. And Dr. Maxwell, can you go ahead and touch on some of these other names we have for this common syndrome? Excellent. You're right. The vernacular has changed over the years, and I thank Scott for taking the time to submit this question. As you had mentioned, the navicular bone is a small bone that we know that sits deep within the hoof at the back of the junction of the coffin bone and the short pastern. The navicular bone has the physical shape of a small canoe, which has led to the name navicular. Navicular in Latin means boat. So originally the term navicular disease was really first used to describe lameness associated with pain that we thought was arising from the navicular bone specifically. Now we understand that the disease process is a little bit more complex and is actually made up of potentially a sum of clinical signs that are associated with the navicular bone and structures around that. So for a period of time, we were using the term navicular syndrome 
syndrome, meaning more than one disease process, adding to the clinical symptoms that we were seeing. I think we've even stepped a little bit further, and I think right now it's probably a little bit more popular to call it caudal heel pain syndrome. I think this is a little bit more correct. We're not always saying the navicular bone is always the isolating cause, but that heel in the caudal part of the foot, the navicular bone is certainly high on our rule out list, but we have to consider other structures that are in there. So from navicular disease, we move to navicular syndrome. And finally, I think most of us are com comfortable with caudal heel pain syndrome. And I'm sure Dr. Peters may have a, uh, some addition to that if he cares. And Dr. Peters, I, I know there's more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Tori explained that very, very well uh, in terms of um, uh, the most common uh, terminology we hear. There's certainly some scientific terminology uh, we call it the pototrochlear uh, pain syndrome, uh, which involves, again, the back half of the foot. And that's probably one that uh, uh, occasionally clients will hear uh, from their veterinarian. Uh, and actually more common in uh, the European countries, uh, they speak of it more than uh, the navicular syndrome. So I just wanted you to say pototrochlear so I didn't have to. So thank you, Dr. Peters. <laughs> Um, our next question is for you, Dr. Peters, and it's from uh, Joanne in Idaho. And she wants to know if there's one thing more than others that predisposes a horse to navicular. Uh, this is really a tough question uh, because there isn't. We have not been able to isolate one thing uh, that that predisposes a horse to the problem. Uh, there are, have been studies out there that look at different risk factors uh, and try to sort those out and prioritize those, but unfortunately there is not one thing that predisposes. Uh, people have talked about breed, uh, breed uh, predisposition, uh, and certainly it's a well-known syndrome in quarter horses, uh, and is it because of smaller feet, bigger bodies? Uh, we don't know that for sure. We still see uh, the same type of problems associated with uh, warm bloods, thoroughbreds, or Arabians. So um, it isn't necessarily a, a breed problem. Uh, we talk about the exercise load or whether horses working at a young age uh, can have more of a problem uh, related to pressure and stresses in that area that may predispose them. But again, that's never truly scientifically been proven. Um, as to whether or not that's a problem. Uh, we certainly talk about uh, shoeing and management uh, of the feet um, as to whether or not um, horses, uh, because of shoeing, because of uh, the way their feet are, confirmation of their feet, are they more predisposed? But uh, honestly, again, research has not uh, shown that that's necessarily a problem. In fact, uh, there was something that came out fairly recently of someone doing some work on uh, fossilized uh, navicular bones and, and uh, sort of prehistoric uh, horses that uh, indicated that they may have had some navicular problem at that point. I don't know how they determined that, uh, but uh, this problem has probably been there for quite some time, even in, in our wild horses or feral horses too, uh, in terms of, uh, a condition causing lameness uh, and not allowing them to get away from predators. But no, there isn't one thing that predisposes a horse to navicular disease. So, Dr. Peters, you mentioned the small foot, big body um, combination that many people think of when they think of especially quarter horses with navicular. Do you uh, see a certain type of foot that is more likely to have navicular problems? Is it a long toe, low heel thing, or is does it just depend on the case and the horse? It depends mostly on the case and the horse because we do see it, uh, as you mentioned, in the low heel, long toe, uh, which is not necessarily the quarter horses. Uh, and they actually go the other direction where they may be a little more upright, a little smaller foot, a little blockier foot, carry a little more heel and tend to stab their toe a little more. Uh, so it can be 
uh, a problem in either one of those confirmations. Um, Dr. Maxwell, our next question is from Pam in Bel Air, California. She wants to know what age does navicular syndrome usually start? Yeah, I thought this was actually sort of an interesting question, and I sort of ties in a little bit with Dr. Peters was really just talking about, and that I would, I hate to incriminate any one particular age group, so I'm going to generalize and say middle to sort of senior aged horses. We typically don't see it in young stock, say two, three, in uh, my particular show horse population, but they may see it a little bit earlier in the quarter horse population. And again, I certainly was brought up believing that there were a lot of conformational defects that may attribute to syndicular syndrome, just like we discussed, whether it was an upright pastern or small narrow feet or something like that. And I think we've been learning and leaping forward a little bit and that there actually may be a genetic marker for these particular horses. And these horses may or may not express that. And I think we're learning a lot about DNA, DNA analysis, and whether or not there is maybe a navicular gene, which in fact may be expressed. So young stock, I typically don't see navicular syndrome or want to incriminate horses at a young age with navicular syndrome, but it does seem to be a disease more of the middle-aged and then sometimes to the senior horse. Does it occur more often in geldings than mares, or does it... Does it seem to matter? Typically, I would say the geldings have, in a lot of the studies that we looked at and the data that I've reviewed over the years in the research, the gelding is typically overrepresented in this particular category. And there are probably a number of reasons why. He's, uh, he's a good, sturdy companion. He can go for long periods of time. His career, once it's good, doesn't wind up in the breeding shed. In other words, the mares may be pulled to go into a reproductive, and even the stallions may be, where the gelding kind of has to kind of keep on to be the champion and move ahead. In other words, he stays in his work environment for a longer period of time than, say, maybe the mare or the stallion. So geldings have a tendency to be overrepresented across all breeds. Dr. Peters, our next question is for you. It's from Heather in Tennessee, and she wants to know what the early warning, warning signs of navicular are and how to prevent it once you see those warning signs. Yeah, this is a complex question, uh, but interesting um, and insightful because if you can pick up some of these early signs, maybe you can intervene uh, a bit sooner and have a better outcome or better manage the condition. So um, I think it's uh, a nice question in that regard. But generally, as Dr. Maxwell stated, that most of these horses are in a, a consistent work program, either as a pleasure horse or as a show horse or a competition type sport horse. And some of the early things you see tend to find are that all of a sudden that stride doesn't seem as fluid doesn't seem as comfortable as maybe uh, what you noticed before. Uh, you may find that after shoeing that all of a sudden the horse has a few days that uh, they don't quite seem right. Uh, they're a little more reluctant. Um, and again, not the gait is not as natural as what it's been. You might see some early signs that uh, the horse on circles or on turns tends to show a little shortness in their gait, uh, one direction or the other. Uh, or you may find that, you know, one day you ride your horse and, and turning to the right, he doesn't quite seem right. And, then, and another day it's turning to the left. It may be a little bit of a, a shifting leg type of thing uh, that you start to appreciate. Uh, the other thing you may see is some stumbling. Uh, uh, this is probably fairly consistent that horses tend to try to unweight their heels if they've got pain there. And so they tend to stab their toe into the ground a little bit. And so what happens is they'll shorten their stride or they'll try to get their toe down, their foot down a little sooner so they don't have to reach out and land in their heel as much. And so they'll tend to stab the ground and catch the ground and some of these horses uh, will start stumbling. Uh, and that can be, 
you know, when you don't expect it, or or it may be something that you hadn't noticed in your horse before. And so these things are probably the best early warning sign are things of um, actually feeling a change in the movement of your horse and being able to appreciate that. Um, as things get a little more chronic, you can actually probably see some changes in the foot growth over time, where a lot of these horses will, again, try to get off their heel. And so the heel will actually grow to try to get down to the ground faster uh, to give them some support. And so some of these horses will start to uh, get a little blocky in their foot, or they will try to uh, try to narrow and sort of get a contraction of their foot uh, because they're not getting the normal pressure down through the back back half of their foot and and pressure expansion uh, digital cushion action frog action that the, the foot needs to stay healthy and so you may see a change in the uh, conformation of the architecture of the foot there uh, in terms of how you can best deal with this in terms of a prevention aspect is probably to get some professional help to get a look at this horse and try to diagnose uh, if that problem is related to the navicular region. Uh, and as we've talked about, there are a lot of structures there, the bone, uh, the ligaments that hold the bone in place, the ligaments that support the um, bone itself uh, from one side to the other, and then the deep flexor tendon, which comes down and rides over that navicular bone and attaches down to the bottom of the foot. And this is where uh, our more recent technology has allowed us to look at these areas a little better and, uh, and try to get a better diagnosis. But pr probably the best prevention is to try, to try to get some help to decide why your horse is uh, not moving the way uh, they used to or why you're getting this change in the gate. We have a question for Dr. Maxwell from our live audience. Peter wants to know if there's any such thing as sore heels in a horse without being navicular. Uh, do we see sore heels that aren't associated with navicular syndrome? Actually, that's a very good question. And in fact, we do. There are a number of different pathologies that we can see in the caudal aspect of the heels. Sometimes it can be something as simple as just some bruising, bruising in the digital cushion, maybe even some minor bruising inside of the bone itself. We can have things such as sheared heels, where the outside or the lateral part and the medial, the inside part of the bulbs of the heels, don't meet uh, the ground equally. One is higher than the other. So when the horse hits the ground, we wind up shearing those horses back and forth which can create a lot of caudal heel pain. So when we see caudal heel pain, we don't want to jump to navicular disease as the uh, knee-jerk response uh, diagnosis. We want to take the time to block, put on hoof testers, do some of the diagnostics to determine whether or not that is an acute or a chronic situation that we're dealing with. Uh, Dr. Peters, we have a question from Jan in Madison, Wisconsin. You already mentioned a little bit, uh, both of you, about diagnosis. Um, but Jan wants to know if a horse has been diagnosed using an MRI, can you monitor the foot without doing additional MRIs and incurring the cost of that on a regular basis? Uh, yes, there are different ways to monitor uh, once you have a diagnosis. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, probably the best thing is the clinical presentation. Is that horse uh, now moving better? Is the horse doing its job better than than what originally caused you to to follow that up or or to look for that problem? Um, and so the clinical aspects uh, are going to tell you whether on, you're on the right direction uh, in terms of managing the condition. So that's helpful if you wanted to if you actually have a navicular bone problem that has uh, either bone edema or bone remodeling going on uh, you may be able to uh, evaluate that a, a couple of different ways sometimes radiographs if, once you know the condition uh, and it's been diagnosed with an mri sometimes follow-up radiographs are enough to be able to 
do some monitoring. The other thing you have is uh, something like uh, nuclear scintigraphy or a bone scan is the common term to look at the actual metabolism of the bone and see whether or not that bone is inflamed or the inflammation is going down. Um, if you if, if you have picked that up with an MRI, and that is a little uh, less expensive than say redoing an MRI, but pro probably ideally, yes, you'd like to come back and probably monitor that somewhere down the line with an MRI to be able to say, okay, things have quieted down. Our treatments seem to be working well. Uh, we've changed our exercise level to where this horse is comfortable and uh, all those things, uh, then an MRI will go ahead and validate what you're doing in terms of treatment, mm -hmm. in terms of being successful. So ideally, the gold standard would probably be to go ahead and do an MRI again, but there may be other ways to uh, monitor that and sort of check yourself any, any way from the, just the physical clinical progression of, of how the horse is doing to x-rays, bone scan, something like that. Dr. Peters, I, I have a gelding who has a little bit of an issue uh, with his navicular. And I know my farrier, he would like me to do x-rays every uh, five weeks, you know, every time he shoes the horse, which just isn't reasonable for, for my budget. Um, how often should you be doing x-rays and how useful are they for the farrier in, in helping the horse? I think that is a comfort zone with every farrier. Uh, I think there are a number of farriers that, that feel once they have that initial and they have gotten the horse um, comfortable, then they may not need to have radiographs every five weeks. Uh, some other people may say, hey, this horse is just so so much on the fence. I don't want to do anything that's going to disrupt that, that that structural visual is very important for them. So I think that goes along with each farrier and their comfort level. Uh, in my mind, again, it comes down somewhat to the clinical uh, presentation and how the horse is responding to the, the mechanical forces that the uh, farrier is trying to affect. And if the horse is doing well then and the farrier feels comfortable, then uh, I think probably six months may be the earliest that uh, I would say you might need to take some radiographs and it may even be a year. And I am getting a note from uh, one of our producers that Ophelia in our live audience wanted to ask that question. So hopefully that helps you out, Ophelia. If you have any follow-ups, please let us know. Um, our next question is for uh, Dr. Maxwell, and it's from Lisa in Iowa. And Lisa wants to know about the deep digital flexor tendon and its involvement in navicular syndrome. What do we know, Dr. Maxwell? Well, again, there are a number of soft tissue structures that are in the foot. So even though the topic is the navicular bone, we really should broaden that category to include a number of tendon and ligaments that are inside of the foot. One of the big primary functions of the navicular bone is to be able to provide a gliding surface at the point where the deep digital flexor changes angle. So the deep digital flexor extending from way up behind the knee all the way down the back of the cannon bone, wraps underneath the fetlock, drops down in between the bulbs of the heel of the foot, and extends all the way back down to the back of the coffin bone and inserts on these sort of semi-lunar crests that sit on the back of the um, coffin bone. And they actually li literally pull the foot down into the ground and pull the limb back as the horse is doing his biomechanics. We know that the DDF, especially with the advent of MRI, MRI, we've been tossing it around a bit tonight, has been really a revolutionary diagnostic imaging when it comes to the foot. For hundreds of years, the foot has been a bit of a black box, if you will, of which we have been making a lot of assumptions. The navicular bone was really being incriminated in what was ultimately probably a lot of soft tissue damage, but we were just not knowledgeable enough or just could not reach to those conclusions. 
now that we have the advent of looking inside of the foot and looking at these soft tissue structures with these different types of MR weighted images and the number of sections and slices that they're able to get, and then qualified diagnostic uh, radiologists that are able to interpret what they see, we're understanding that if horses are being treated for what we believe is navicular syndrome, he blocks like a navicular horse to a low PD, we radiograph him, his navicular bone may show some clinic, uh, typical bony pathology. We treat him as a bony case, but then he does not wind up responding. We then start to go for further diagnostics, and an MRI is a great way to look at those soft tissue structures, one of them being the deep digital flexor tendon. And whether there's an insertion on the back of the bone that may have a lesion, whether there's a linear lesion somewhere up inside that DDF, we're able to look at that. So they're a little bit married together. The navicular bone needs the DDF, and the DDF needs the navicular bone. So it's easy to see when either one of those structures under a tremendous amount of strain or insult, one of them may begin to be the beginning of sort of uh, the lameness that we see. We have a question from our live audience, and I'll give this one to you, to you, Dr. Peters. It's from Rod in Columbia, and he has a mule that's navicular. He wants to know if there is a cure or what some treatment approaches might be for his mule. Uh, if the mule is uh, wearing shoes, uh, probably initially, you know, mechanically trying to take some of the pressure off that navicular apparatus. Uh, if the mule is not shod, then trimming the foot to try to uh, help uh, that navicular apparatus also. And taking some of the mechanical pressures off the navicular bone in terms of uh, the support through the suspensory ligaments of the navicular bone and also uh, the deep flexor tendon that was just talked about by uh, Dr. Maxwell. And so, you know, easing the breakover mechanically uh, in that mule. So as the horse stretches his foot back just before it takes off from the ground, uh, allowing that horse to not have too, or that mule not to have too long of a toe, uh, even though they tend to be upright, but allowing that to break over and decrease some of the, the tension on the navicular apparatus from the deep flexor tendon um, may be enough to help. Uh, it may not. Uh, then you may need to have some medications uh, that will help with inflammation or possibly some medications that will affect the metabolism of the bone itself that can decrease some of the bone pain if it, the pain is truly coming from the navicular bone itself. So there are a variety of things that can be done uh, in terms of what the horse or the mule is doing in terms of exercise load. It may require a little bit of decrease in that exercise for a while, or even a little bit of a rest period to let that inflammation associated with the bone or the soft tissues around that bone to sort of relax and, and reset and, and get rid of some of that inflammation and, and the pain that's associated with it. Okay. So, Dr. Peters, you've mentioned uh, some drug therapies that might be available for horses with navicular, what are our options there? You said pain management and bone metabolism. Uh, can you address both of those areas and ex explain that to our audience a little bit? Uh, sure. I think the mainstay are, have been pretty much the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and those include but, uh, phenylbutazone, banamine, uh, uh, a number of others uh, that have been useful in, in terms of that. Um, a number of those are available or allowed in competition uh, to, to allow the horse to, to compete uh, if they have a little soreness, but in no way are, is it at a level that allows them to mask the, any type of lameness. Um, but it is useful and to quiet down the inflammation. Uh, the other thing that uh, people have certainly tried are some uh, blood flow drugs uh, like isoxaprin or warfarin, something like that. Uh, there was a time when we truly believed that it was completely a blood flow problem to the bone uh, that allowed that bone to sort of 
go into sort of a degenerative type process over time and trying to increase the blood flow and uh, to remove disease bone as well as to help stimulate uh, remodeling of that bone in a healthy way uh, was uh, useful. Uh, those things have not panned out to be quite as, as useful as we originally thought or some of the early studies showed, but isoxaprine is still used on a very common basis uh, by a number of people. Uh, the other thing that is, um, is used in terms of metabolism of the bone is uh, the bisphosphonates, which are uh, come over from human uh, usage uh, that affect the metabolism of the bone in terms of the remodeling process that goes on. And it affects primarily mostly the cells that, that tend to chew up the bone. And so by using these bisphosphonates, it helps to moderate the activity of what's called the osteoclast, and uh, that in a way uh, sort of tempers some of the remodeling and the, and the bone inflammation that's going on and the pain associated with that. Dr. Maxwell can actually talk to that a little better than I, t I can uh, mm -hmm. in terms of her uh, association with some of these drugs. Uh, I use them primarily as a clinical uh, effect on the horse and uh, have shown them to be very useful. She can talk a little more about the actual pharma, pharma, pharmacokinetics and pharmaceutical aspects of the drug in terms of how it works on the bone. So I'll defer to her. I, I thought that was quite a good summary, sir. I, <laughs> Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, and um, do you do you want to go into a little bit more about how the bisphosphonates sure. work? Because I think that's something, sure. in, yeah, that not mm -hmm. not all of us horse owners um, are familiar with, unless we've taken yep. some high level biology. So can can you explain <laughs> a little bit how that works? Understood. You know, so the class of drug uh, is called bisphosphonate. Bi means two. Phosphonate is phosphor, so it's a drug that is made with two phosphorus ends. And the reason I think it's important to realize that a new class of drug has not really been introduced into equine veterinarians for quite some time. So this is an older drug. It's been around since the late 1960s and utilized in humans, mainly for osteoporosis or osteopenia or bone thinning, if you will. And most of us consider that disease of typically geriatric and typically geriatric women. So we understand that as women and men typically age, the bone is no longer in what we call homeostasis. All through the beginning of our lives, we lay down new bone and old bone is being taken away. I'm in my mid fifties. I've probably had two full new skeletons even since high school, but my body has done it in such an efficient way that I've had no net loss or no net gain of bone. I haven't even noticed that this has been going on. The same is true for mammals, including our horses. But when the bone gets out of homeostasis or synchronicity, and the bone is digesting or becoming thinner, faster than a cell called an osteoblast is capable of laying it down, we start to see radiographic changes of thinning. So in the case of the navicular, we have an idea that we've walked a horse, jogged a horse, we've taken some radiographs and we notice that the bone is a little bit thinner or more lytic than we would like it to be. Somehow it's lost its lucency, if you will, or density inside of the bone. So what the bisphosphonates do is they turn off a cell, an osteoclastic period, only specific to that area of the bone, the navicular, for a period of time to allow the osteoblast to catch up so the bone is able to go back into a homeostasis or more of a natural um, uh, net loss, net gain, if you will. Some horses require one injection and the bone is able to go back where osteoblasts and osteoclasts are acting in a more normal pattern. Some horses have a disease process that's a little bit more chronic or a little bit more advanced. Those horses may need more than one particular dosing, but it's going to be based on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. 
There is no cookie cutter formula for this. We need to take each case individually as it comes along. I um, think the other thing while, while we're right here, I'm sorry to interrupt you, is that you're not really getting the disease to go backwards. You're really arresting the disease, the state that it's in. In other words, I can't take a bone, it's a 10 year old bone and make it go backwards to be the bone of a four year old horse. What I'm able to do is manage the changes that have happened within the bone of that particular patient, along with the pharmaceutical, along with the shoeing, along with some good footing choices, all go into having the outcome come out as well as possible. But having a new pharmaceutical that addresses the bone has been a very unique introduction with bisphosphonates into the equine community. Thank you for that. Um, we have a follow-up question going back to MRIs from Ophelia in our live audience. She said that we've touched on MRIs loose in the conversation, but more specifically, she wants to know what the benefits are of having an MRI versus x-rays done on a horse that, that, that you suspect is navicular. Do you feel that the more expensive MRI is worth using in addition or instead of radiographs? Dr. Peters, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, the nice thing about the MRI uh, in comparison to x-rays is that the MRI can look at metabolism and physiology as well as anatomy. X-rays or ultrasound just look at anatomy. And then based on that anatomy that we see as veterinarians or radiologists or, you know, as seasoned practitioners, uh, whatever, uh, we go ahead and make an assessment to say, Ooh, that bone looks lytic, or it, it doesn't look like it's got as much density as it should, or that bone looks like it is too dense in one area or uh, losing bone in another area. And so we make those assumptions. We don't actually know if that is happening. By doing an MRI, you actually are able to look at the anatomy and you get very, very, very good resolution. And then along with that, you can look at actually the physiology of what's going on in those tissues, whether it's a bony tissue or whether it's a ligament or a tendon uh, or even uh, uh, sometimes in cartilage and in, in joints, depending on how we look at those different sections and, and contrast material we use. So we can actually look at the anatomy and see, okay, there is in fact a, a damage to that bone or the structure of that bone. But more importantly, we can look at it and say, that bone is going through active inflammation because of the images we're seeing. And we know there's inflammation in that bone. We know there's pain associated with that inflammation. And then we can say, okay, we need to address this specifically because we know exactly what we're dealing with. And that makes our treatment more, hopefully more successful uh, in terms of of uh, being able to say, okay, you know, here we know we have a bone issue. Uh, there is edema within this bone we have to get rid of. Along with that, we've got a deep flexor tendon that's got uh, a longitudinal tear in it uh, right over the area of the navicular bone. We've got two different problems that we need to address, and they may not have the same treatment. We may have to deal with them uh, coming from different approaches. One may be more from the mechanical approach, maybe the other more from a pharmacological uh, approach. So the MRI has the advantage of being able to do that for us over x-rays. We have a question from our live audience from Dr. Maxwell. Calvin is in Missouri and has uh, been treating his uh, gelding, his 14-year-old gelding with Osphos for the past three years. Um, but he says that after about six months, and lameness returns. Will he need to continue mm -hmm. treatments indefinitely on this horse? Yeah, most likely. The nice part about that story is that the patient is responding in a favorable way. So when you wind up administering the drug, say in the muscle, it is looking for places of unusually high metabolic bone turnover or bone that is going through a highly active state. And it winds up adhering to the bone at those particular areas and it stays bound to that bone. 
And then what it's doing is these osteoclasts, the cells that digest bone, think of C's for cleaning up, they digest bone. It stops them from taking the bone down any further. In the meantime, it's allowing those osteoblasts, blasts into something sort of coming out of a hose, the osteoblast lays down something called osteon. And ultimately what happens is that the osteon buries that bisphosphonate down inside of the lacuna of the bone so that the drug is not able to communicate with the surface anymore. So it's no longer able to really have an influence on those osteoclasts. So a horse that has responded favorably for about five or six months, and then the clinical signs of lameness come back, probably very early in the turn, you may have noticed it, or maybe the stumbling and the toe um, 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 diving that we had mentioned a little bit earlier, that is the time that I would consider a redose with OSPOS based on what we know now. So redosing is not uncommon, especially on those chronic cases, because we're not making the bone go backward. We're holding it and we're providing some tensile strength to the bone. Radiographically, the bone is not gonna change very much. If you come back and take a radiograph in six months and you still see some radiographic changes, I don't want you to be disappointed. I want you to understand that the pharmaceutical is helping with the trabecular strength of the bone, so the horse can handle the load, but there are still some various pathology that is still part of that. Does that make sense, Melissa? Um, yeah, and we have a question from Susan in California in our live audience, and she wants to know how she can know that the OSFOS injection is working for her horse. So the first thing that we need before we even do treatment is we need a proper diagnosis. So if I believe if the patient that I am looking at has blocked like a navicular horse, he jogs like a navicular horse, he radiographs like a navicular horse, I personally have convinced myself that navicular uh, disease or syndrome or prototrochlear apparatus is, is what this horse's problem is. I begin to put in those uh, multimodal changes that we've talked about, the shoeing, of course, but when I add the bisphosphonate or osphos on board, I expect to see improvement in about 30 days. So I give it to him on December 1st. I would anticipate about December 30th to see a dramatic improvement in clinical signs, which is ultimately going to be soundness. At the end of that 30-day period, if I felt like the horse was not improving, he maintains the same level of pain, he still had jogged lame in the circles, we could still block him out with a PD, I don't think that his primary per, uh, uh, pathology might be related to the navicular bone. It may be related to other soft tissue structures in the foot. That is a horse that I would move into the MR and find out exactly which structure is going on. So here's an example of for many years we were incriminating the navicular bone when in fact it may have been something else. So the bisphosphonate should give me improvement within about 30 days of, after administration and I would expect about at least six months of improvement in that particular horse, which is very rare. We've never had a pharmaceutical that, A, takes a little, little bit longer on onset. Most people are used to butyl vitamins and NSAIDs that provide relief within 24 to 48 hours. Now you have to wait 30 days. That seems very unusual. But what we're asking the, the bone to do is basically repair itself. The bone is very, very, very good at fixing itself and repairing. And what we're doing is trying to put those uh, cells into an advantage to give the bone back the strength that we want it to. Thank okay. you. Um, our next question is for Dr. Peters, and it's kind of a combination question. Um, Jean in our live audience would, know if navic would like to know if navicular horses require a specialized diet. And Samantha, who's in our live audience from Virginia, wants to know if there are any supplements that you recommend for horses that have navicular? Um, yes, I think, I think nutrition can play a, a big role, and it's primarily uh, the horse that's overweight. I think in general, most of our horses, we like to see big and round and, and a little on the heavy side, and this is a detriment to horses that tend to have sore feet, uh, and especially problems uh, associated with the back of their foot. 
so keeping a horse uh, a little bit on the lighter side, it's usually beneficial uh, for these horses not to carry that extra weight. It sure helps for me too when uh, uh, in that situation. So, um, you know, I think nutrition can play a role there uh, in terms of that. There is not anything uh, that I know of per se that uh, a nutritional uh, a component that says uh, if you use more of this, uh, you're going to decrease uh, navicular problems. Uh, there are uh, supplements out there that say they can certainly help in terms of uh, some of the signs associated with uh, foot problems and, and soreness. Um, some of the homeopathic anti-inflammatories can be useful. Um, things like uh, uh, MSM uh, in some of these uh, supplements can be beneficial. Uh, the echinacea. Uh, oh, Dr. Maxwell, you may need to help me out on, on another some of, the, of these. Yeah, phycocyanins, the glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate. Because you know, bone and joint are really intimately involved. We have a tendency to sort of talk about just one disease process, but we really want to keep the whole patient in mind. The horses that are doing high repetitive load and there's bony pathology, then we have to consider that there's cartilage pathology. And I agree that the weight management is really essential in these cases. So that's part of the multimodal that we talk about. And I have, I have two follow-up questions for that. So when we're talking about the, the horse's weight, do you have an ideal body condition that you would recommend for a horse that's, um, that's showing signs of navicular? I know like for our dressage horses and our hunter horses, sometimes we get them a little bit rounder, um, probably more like a six, should we bring them down to like a five body score? Or do you have a, a point that you can tell us, like is there a bullseye that's gonna be just right for our horse, Dr. Dr. Maxwell? I like to actually prefer a leaner horse, to be honest with you. I think these are athletes, and I think we put a lot of stress on their joints, on their body, on their heart, on their lungs when we keep them so robust. I realize a lot of these horses are on the road. They might start out a season and go three or four weeks into a season and lose 100 or 150 pounds relatively quickly. But I do see horses being driven in sort of a metabolic state with this sort of excessive uh, fat that we have on. So for my hunters, I can do a six body score, maybe a six five to a seven. For my jumpers, I like them at a five. I can put weight on them, I want them to fit. If I look at the horses, especially if you look at a lot of the successful European riders, their horses are not overweight. There are some breeds that are prone to carrying a little bit more weight. And there are certainly some horses that will also individually have that problem. But, you know, I think too much uh, um, concentration. I like a lot of hay, hay in front of them all day long, that their GI do what was naturally intended to do. When we feed them large amounts of concentrate, I think we're doing them a bit of a discourtesy try to keep their ulcers down, try to keep them metabolically as happy as we possibly can. So good question. Yeah, and Dr. Maxwell, you also mentioned uh, several supplements that are considered uh, joint supplements. If a horse has osteoarthritis, are they more likely to have navicular issues as well? Are they related? Oh, that's a good question. And I would say typically not um, in general. If I have a horse that has joint pain, and I'll use something as simple as say a, a left front uh, ankle, and if that ankle is having a little bit of a fusion, the cartilage isn't as thick and as robust as I would like it to be, it doesn't lead that into navicular uh, disease or syndrome. The navicular bone is, a, is an interesting little bone. He behaves very differently than a lot of the other bones in the body. And he has a response to, you know, what we think is load or repetitive load. And we're not even sure that that's actually true. I don't know if there are any callers on the phone that deal with standard breads. And I would be surprised if there were because I've never seen a breed with a lower incidence of navicular syndrome 
than the amazing standard bred racehorse. Yet I don't see a horse that works on any harder surface than the standard bred horse. So I think that's kind of interesting that they're under such a concussive load, yet their incidence of navicular is so low. But generally speaking, joint disease, subchondral bone pain does not typically lead a horse into navicular uh, pathology. Dr. Peters, we have a question from uh, Kimber in our live audience. She's from Kansas, and she wants to know if allowing a horse to go barefoot can help manage navicular. Uh, yes. Before I answer that, I'd like to reiterate uh, a lot of what Dr. Maxwell said there. And in terms of my condition scores on these horses, I like the I like hunters that are down around five, and mm -hmm. I like jumpers around four. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm a little a little harder on them than Dr. Maxwell is in terms of uh, asking them to be a little more athletic looking, I think. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, barefoot trimming and barefoot horses, uh, yes, that can be very useful for some of these horses. Uh, some of the some of the shoeing can actually not allow uh, the foot to do what it's supposed to in terms of how it contacts the ground, how the frog and the digital cushion interact with some of the inner structures of the foot. And so, yes, some of these horses will respond um, to removing their shoes, getting some time off, letting their foot sort of uh, re-establish itself and uh, sort of allow a, a change in the support structure of the foot that can help to decrease some of the inflammation that may be associated with some of those structures within the hoof capsule. I have seen horses that have responded to uh, just that management and done very well. Um, it isn't for everyone, and, and I'm, I can't say I'm a huge advocate of pulling shoes on horses and, uh, and going ahead and uh, expecting them to work at the same level but I have seen some horses respond to that when they haven't responded to a number of things that uh, you think should be helpful for them. So they don't, they all don't read the, te the textbooks or the scientific journals. And sometimes you just have to uh, go ahead and try something different uh, and uh, see how it works. But I have seen some horses be very successful with uh, going barefoot with, uh, with true navicular bone problems. And to go back to that body score condition conversation, Jennifer, our web producer, has posted a link to our body score condition poster. So if anyone's with us or has joined us online, you can click on that link and get a guide to what we're talking about with all those different body scores. Um, so thank you, and thank you, Dr. Peters, for that. Um, we have a, a question from Karen in our live audience, um, and I'm going to let you guys decide which one of you want to take this one because we're going into surgery. Uh, Karen from our live audience has a five-year-old gelding that had a bilateral uh, neurectomy three months ago. He's no longer showing pain and is going great. Should she continue to treat the navicular, or can she expect that since he's using himself, he m might be able to that might help arrest or improve the navicular degeneration. Do I have a, a volunteer to, to jump in? Um, I'd be happy to take that. Um, okay. Dr. Peters? I think it, yeah, I think it uh, depends on the diagnosis to some degree. If, the, if it is truly a bone problem, uh, then she may be doing very well. If it's related to some soft tissues in there, then she may have to monitor that uh, or uh, temper, modify that uh, exercise load uh, associated with that. Uh, three months afterwards, after, you said three or five months after surgery? I think it was five. Three. Five? Three, three, three. months. It's a okay. five-year-old horse three. and it, it was three months ago. Yeah, uh, that's relatively early. And I would expect good results at, at that point in time, uh, but I would be reluctant to, you know, expect that horse to go back to the same level of exercise uh, uh, that quickly. 
it varies as to how people manage these horses uh, after denerving. Um, when I was doing a number of those surgeries, we used to uh, give them about 90 days before they got back into some regular work. And I think that really probably allowed the inflammation in the foot to quiet down. I would say the ones that people wanted to rush back and try to get back uh, going uh, relatively quickly at 45 to 60 days, those horses didn't seem to respond as well. And they seem to have uh, more trouble in in the long run uh, in relation to the success of the norectomy. Uh, but horses can be very serviceably sound. And uh, we've seen some horses go and compete at the at top levels after uh, norectomy. Interestingly enough also is that when norectomies were being done more for so-called navicular disease, and this is probably 20, 25 years ago, uh, that a number of these horses would, after even after the nerves grew back in that area, because they always do, uh, those horses would be sound. And uh, we did not have the bisphosphonates. We did not have some of these things that uh, worked on the metabolism of the bone uh, that are now uh, very helpful, as we know. Uh, and so why were these horses all of a sudden sound? Uh, was it because that they were allowed to break that cycle of pain for a period of time, use that foot more normally, and the, no and the bone and the foot was able to um, repair itself because the foot was working properly, it was waiting the way it should, uh, the blood supply was more normal in terms of the action of the foot and the digital cushion and the frog and things we've all talked about. I don't know for sure, but I do know a number of these horses, even after sensation returned to those areas, these horses stayed sound. Uh, the other possibility is we had the wrong diagnosis. Uh, when we did the norectomy on these horses, and uh, we were actually treating uh, maybe a soft tissue injury that was amenable to exercise. And anyone that's had a human soft tissue industry, injury, uh, the treatment is not necessarily to rest. The treatment is to do a controlled exercise loading program and try to get that structure to uh, accommodate and adapt and, and heal during the process of, of exercise. And maybe we were actually treating some things we, uh, we did not know about. So, norectomy can be a very useful technique. And uh, like I said, uh, for this horse, uh, at 90 days post uh, surgery, um, I would not expect that horse to, to really be back to its regular exercise at this point, but hopefully be able to go on from here and build on it and move forward. Okay. Uh, we have another question from our live audience, Dr. Maxwell, see if you wanna answer this one. It's uh, from Dustin. Mm -hmm. And Dustin wants to know if using a wedge when shoeing an avicular horse will help or hinder it long-term. Again, I think it's a little bit dependent on the particular case. So the physics of what we're trying to do by putting a wedge either two or three degrees underneath the heel of the horse is to try to lift the back of the foot up a little bit so that deep digital flexor that I talked about a little bit earlier and the fulcrum that the navicular bone is acting on is that we're trying to release that pressure on the back of the navicular bone for a period of time. There are some horses that we can put in wedges that do respond, start to get a little bit of relief, and can go on and do their job. However, I find that if we leave them in wedges for too long, that the normal heel of the foot winds up becoming very collapsed. We have to be very careful that we want the foot to become as normal as possible. And by adding these artificial agents sometimes, we wind up drawing in chronic state of a sort of collapsed, a little bit of an underrung heel. So short term, egg bar, pull the shoe back, roll the toe, help the break over, allow the heel if it's responding with the wedge, I will get him in it, but I'm going to try to build up his heels at the same time. 
if I put him in the wedge and he doesn't respond, I'm not going to keep him in it at all. I'm going to try to sign somebody else with the farrier and try to work with the farrier team. Another idea, maybe take those radiographs like you talked about, find the center point, help the farrier and the veterinarian get a good working relationship, share the ideas, share the diagnostic imaging together, maybe watch the horse work together and get the farrier's input about what he thinks going on with that foot as well. So wedges, but I don't leave them in for a long period of time. Duncan, I mean, Dr. Peters? Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm, uh, I think most horses can get away without bar shoes. I'm not a huge compo uh, proponent mm -hmm. of bar shoes on horses. Uh, I try to get them out of bar shoes as, as much as possible. Maybe use something with a wider heel to it or a heel branch uh, to try to mechanically sort of a, accomplish the same thing but allow the heels a little more contact with the ground uh, overall on soft footing. So, um, but I agree completely. If I put them in wedges, uh, I try to get them out as soon as possible uh, in terms of not uh, allowing that contracture uh, of, the, of the flexor tendon because they will contract and go back to the same pressure if you're not careful. And we have actually run out of time, but I do have one question that we've gotten several um, during registration and then also from our live audience. And Dr. Peters, I'll ask you about it um, really quick here. People want to know about using Equiox uh, as an NSAID to help manage their navicular horses. Uh, what, what role does that play in, in the management of a navicular horse? Uh, I think Equiox is a very nice uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for a condition like this. This is a chronic condition, uh, and the nice thing about uh, Equiox is that you can use it for a longer period of time without some of the side effects of some of the other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So for me, uh, it is one of the drugs that I will go to to keep these horses on for a longer period of time if I'm trying to manage that inflammation over, over a longer period of time. And uh, I've had horses that can be managed on that for 45 days continuously, 30 to 45 days. It isn't recommended to do that, uh, but uh, these horses have not had any problems with, uh, with GI issues or ulcer issues or kidney issues along the way uh, or colonic problems. So I've been very comfortable with uh, using it, and I think it's a very good drug uh, as an anti-inflammatory for these uh, chronic uh, low-grade uh, pain. Uh, I think butambanamine is a little has a little more punch to it, um, and I might use that early on, but then uh, I may switch over to Equiox. Uh, the other nice thing is horses tolerate it very well. Uh, the, the tablets, horses will eat those out of your hand and they're also small enough to put in a very small amount of feed, uh, and the horses tolerate them very well. So it's a very good drug in, in my mind. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peters. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Peters and Dr. Maxwell for joining us. Thank you, uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I hope uh, people were able to get most of their questions answered. It's a very complex subject and uh, can be very frustrating to owners as well as veterinarians and farriers. So um, owners are not alone in that, in that regard. Uh, but certainly there's a lot we can do and to try to manage the disease and, and have a happy and healthy horse. Yeah, I also want to say thank you so much to everybody at the horse. I think that the number of participants, I'm really, really impressed with that, impressed with the people's knowledge or thirst for knowledge when it comes to this particular topic. When you have that number, education is certainly the key, and we need to keep sharing what we know. And I know it seems frustrating, but we are slowly inching forward decade by decade by decade. We're learning a lot more. So this educational platform of the webinar is just an excellent, excellent, current, real-time way to have really a complex um, topic out in front of us. So again, thank you to Michelle and her team for putting this together.
Well, thank you. And I also want to thank everyone who listened live and everyone who submitted questions, uh, everyone who listens to the archive once we post it on the website, and it will be on thehorse.com uh, by tomorrow morning. I also want to thank our sponsor, uh, DECRA Veterinary Products, for bringing this to everyone tonight uh, for free. I, I hope you'll join us next month. Uh, we're going to be talking about adopting and caring for off-track thoroughbreds and taking them from track to their new careers and making sure they're healthy while you do that. Uh, until then, from all of us here at The Horse, have a great night.